In part one, we talked about the API object and how API calls to a URI can tie to an object. Once we understand how this works, we can now link referenced URI calls to one another through their corresponding object. This is known as API chaining. An API chain works like a series of requests, except that one request is the primary and everything else chains from or to that request. And since we can only send data for one request, there can only be one unsafe method. In other words, you can have as many gets as you want, but can only have one put, post, or delete. That unsafe method must either be at the end of the chain, known as a post chain, or at the beginning of the chain, known as a pre-chain. Also, a chain can always be returned early and restarted so that you can chain off of a chain. This gives us the ability to create two separate requests from the same data set if we need to. And as chains only rely on the first key, you can block showing all additional keys to users, but allow access to back-end services, thus making the only way to access methods with hidden keys through pre-generated chains. So how does it work? Think of the URIs as making phone calls to each other. How would they make that call? They need some sort of phone number to reference each other. That's where the API object reference variable comes in. This allows us to reference objects through the URI, and as each dataset comes back, we can tell it which variable to return as the key to the next URI in the sequence. So in theory, it looks like this, but in actuality, it looks like this. But how does the client know each key? Well, all information needed for your API docs is also contained in the API object, since it is also a complete abstraction layer. So when you build your API object, you are also building out your API docs as well. Thank you for listening. Please feel free to send us your comments and feedback.